Good morning. Welcome to this uh, recorded service of Starkville Presbyterian Church. We come to you this morning, and perhaps you're watching via YouTube or our Facebook page or perhaps our church website. We're glad you're joining us here on this fourth Sunday of Easter. Uh, uh, the calendar date is uh, Sunday, April the 25th. I want to share with you our joy of being with you and to remind you of the services that we have, our live in-person services each Sunday morning at 10 a.m. on our sanctuary located at 28 Linden Circle here in Starkville. We're across uh, Louisville Street from the Millsaps Vocational Center and Starkville High School. Just to remind you that uh, uh, we share in these services and we ask you if you will let us know either by responding or commenting if you're watching via Facebook, please share this uh, and comment if you'd like or like it. If you're watching by YouTube, again, let us know by sharing that this is something that is meaningful to you as we do this ministry of reaching beyond just our morning worship and our live service. We begin by worshiping today with these words. From the 95th Psalm, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. So today, let us listen to His voice as we hear our hymn of the day. Praise God in song, we greet Him using the scriptures, and we always come together knowing that God is a forgiving God, and so we confess our sins together this morning. Would you bow with me as we pray our prayer of confession? Good and gentle shepherd, you care for your flock faithfully and well, but we foolishly stray from your ways, rejecting your guidance. You generously set a nourishing and sumptuous feast before us, but we reject your provision and fill our hearts and souls with the food of fear and hatred. Forgive our stubborn refusal to trust and to follow you. Bring us back to the fold in your loving embrace for your name's sake. And would you ask now your own personal confessions to God? In the name of Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, we are forgiven. Amen. Today we will read from the scriptures, probably the most, one of the most familiar scriptures possible, and that is the 23rd Psalm. If you're watching at home and wish to say this with me, I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, which differs slightly from the King James. But as you recite with me, use whatever form you're used to as we read together from the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. 
He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And this is the word of God for the people of God, and our response always is thanks be to God. And we affirm our faith as we do each week by using this historic confession of the Christian faith that we commonly call the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life. Everlasting. Amen and Amen. Somebody said it this way and defined for us in the English speaking world in the time of Shakespeare these words All the world's a stage. And of course, Shakespeare said that from as you like it. Metaphors speak of what is and is not designed. To do anything but to help illuminate the meaning of something else. We know from reading the scripture today and reading from the Gospel of John, and I'll read portions of that later in the service, we know from scriptures, and particularly in the scripture from John and from the psalmist, that Jesus is really not a shepherd, although he is good. We, we know that Jesus is literally not a shepherd in the sense that he practiced that as a vocation in the time of his disciples being on this earth in those three years of ministry. And so it is a metaphor. It is a metaphor for giving meaning to his leadership, his care, his provision, his love, his healing, his protection for his flock. John Stott, the great Anglican preacher in whose readings I read vociferously when I was in college and following said in his book Between Two Worlds that a shepherd's role was to feed, to guide, especially when the sheep go astray, and guard against the wolves and to heal the wounds of the injured. When we think about this passage and when we hear this passage, I'm reminded that I have never in my 44 years of ministry, I would say never, but hardly ever, been to a funeral service in which the 23rd Psalm was not used in some fashion, either as I did this a couple of weeks ago when I went to the funeral of an old church member down in Rankin County and it was the primary scripture for the service. Or maybe I went to a funeral and a, and a hymn was sung or the 23rd Psalm was sung or maybe someone mentioned it in the context of the funeral sermon, but it is really part of our culture, especially those of us who were raised in the Bible, the Bible Belt South, that the Lord is our shepherd. Not a metaphor, but real. It is what English teachers and professors call a contextual metaphor, a metaphor that has been used so often and taught so often and we've heard it so often, it becomes a part of us. You know, there are metaphors in the South. My grandmother used to have one. She'd say, the, the, the sun is coming up like lightning this morning. I never quite understood what that meant, but it was a metaphor for the sun breaking out over the trees, not a slow rise of the sun, but all of a sudden, the world was bathed in light, that kind of metaphor. And if you lived in the South and you lived in a place where there were thick pine trees, you know it seems that way sometimes. But there are times when 
just hearing the words, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, may not be enough. We have experienced in the last uh, 14 to 15 months the effects and the after effects, we hope, and the tragedies and then sometimes the victories of this COVID pandemic. There have been times during the COVID pandemic when I would read the 23rd Psalm and think, you know, metaphor is just not enough. It's just not enough. With the violence that has been in our streets in the past year, with the, the tension and the conflict over what is uh, social justice and what will be the right thing to do in, as a result of a trial or the conviction of a police officer, we are caught sometimes, as Stott said, between two worlds. And sometimes the world in which we live in, the world of metaphors and of scripture, sometimes it just doesn't seem like it's quite enough. I know that when we read it, and when Jesus says in John's gospel, I'm the good shepherd, we instantly think of the one who makes us to lie down in green pastures. We jump back to the 23rd Psalm. When we hear that term, the good shepherd, we think about one who will lead us beside still waters and accompanies us wherever we're going through the valley of the shadow of death. And we've been doing a lot of that in the last 15 months. So I asked this question this morning because the human condition being what it is and the human condition being part of all of us, none of us are immune from it. At least I've never met anyone who was immune from being a human being that was human. So that the metaphor of sheep and shepherd in the 23rd Psalm displays so beautifully sometimes our basic human nature. Of course we're not sheep, nor is the Lord a shepherd, literally, but how better to describe what it is for one to trust confidently in something or in someone, in particular the Good Shepherd. I've shared this story on several occasions, but I learned a great deal about sheep when I served as a student pastor in North Georgia while in seminary, the 83 to 85. And they used to say those were the fastest and the slowest two years of our life together. We had a small child, Rebecca, and by the way, we she's turning 39 this week, and that makes us feel very, very, very old. I'm not sure how it makes her feel, though. But we were there with a small child, and, uh, and then shortly after we got there, another child on the way, our son Rob. So we had two small children while we were there. We rushed through seminary in order to get back to Mississippi, not spending the full three years there. It was a church of lively people and of wonderful people. We reconnected with many of them over the last few months of this pandemic through Facebook. But the problem was, was that there was so much going on in our lives and their lives that it seemed very fast. And so one of the people we loved there was a, a couple, the Barefoots. Joe had been a football player at Mississippi State. His wife had gone to MUW. She was an accomplished musician. She often played the piano or the organ there in the Lula United Methodist Church. And I forget one day I was preaching and I, I, I thought I had heard Teresa say that Joe and was a police officer or actually had taught uh, uh, law enforcement at Bernal College in Gainesville, Georgia, just down the road. And so I didn't realize one day when I preached about the sheep, maybe it was this fourth Sunday of Easter, when this passage always comes up. So it would have been in the spring, maybe the spring of 1984, I preached it, and, and I said something about sheep being dumb animals and prone to wander away, and they were generally docile and forgetful creatures, and I uh, began to talk about that, and it was an obvious homiletic point that how wonderful and good the Good Shepherd was. And when the service was over, I kind of got a little bit of an earful. By the way, an earful from Joe Barefoot was, uh that was about all you got. See, Joe was one of those offensive linemen in Mississippi State back in the mid to early 60s. He said, huh. And he said, where'd you get that? I said, well, I heard it actually. It was probably I borrowed it from another preacher down at Emory or maybe one of my fellow students. And he said, huh. He said, well, that explains it. It's probably written by some cowboy preacher, he put it. He said, or some rancher, or somebody that knows nothing about sheep or shepherding. And then he 
he said something that sounded really, really confident. He said, preacher said, I know sheep and they know me. And they do as I say because they know who I am. And it was obvious that he knew that. So that afternoon or sometime that week, we went out to see the sheep and it was a coolish sort of day, sort of like this week has been in the spring. And I went to watch as he walked among them and actually not walk, rode his little four-wheeler the first time I'd seen one of those among them and actually went off and got two of them that had got stuck in some branch, uh, branches and in some briars down by the creek bank. But I learned the difference that day. He said it this way. He said, I think people who handle cows started the rumor that sheep are dumb because sheep don't act like cows. But he also said something else. He said, we, he said, preacher, he said, sometimes he said, I get tired of church. And he said, I get tired of preachers. He said, you preachers act like you're ranchers rather than shepherds. He said, he said, Cows can be herded from the rear, and they can be shouted at, and they can be prodded like the cowboys do riding alongside them. And he said, that really doesn't work with sheep. And it really hit home because, you see, I was a young, energetic preacher and thought all I needed to do was just prod people a little bit and shout at them a little louder from the pulpit and maybe occasionally bang the pulpit or maybe hold my big black Bible open so that everybody could see that I had the authority of the Word of God behind me. In other words, I could push them along into the kingdom of God. Joe said, it doesn't work with sheep. He said, if you get behind sheep or you get beside them making a lot of noises, they'll just huddle up behind you out of fear. He said, they actually prefer to be led, which maybe is why Jesus used this metaphor. Would you say that we've been through a time of prodding and loud and frightening noises surrounding us on all areas of our life? It's a metaphor, by the way. W would you say that it feels like we're being rounded up like cows sometimes and that it sounds like that that's the trail ride and the whips are out and they're trying to just drive us right down into the creek so we'll drink the water instead of leading us like a lamb beside still waters? Does it... Feel that way to you? Has it felt that way to you? By the way, it seemed that way to me. Joe said, sheep will go anywhere that someone else they trust goes before them. Wow. Wow. He said, the sheep and the shepherd develop a bond like nothing else. They even have a language between them that outsiders are not privy to. Joe told me that he had about 100 head, head I guess you call them sheep, but he had 100 sheep, and that he actually had given each one of them a name or a pet name. He actually had a language. He called them. Now more than ever, now more than ever, people, not just in the church, but in the world, don't need to be prodded any more than they are. We're already resistant enough to things being poked in us, aren't we? Sometimes too resistant. We're resistant to the news that comes at us in, in blast, breaking news, breaking news, another trial, another, another uh, death of a young black person, an, another rise because of a variant in COVID. We are just worn out from that and of all times, of any time of our life, of any time of my life, I can't think of a time anymore needed than having a good shepherd who knows the sheep and who leads them quietly beside the still waters. I don't need a metaphor about Jesus being the good shepherd. I need the good shepherd. What about you? You see, it's not the metaphor we may remember it. We may stick in our minds. It may be clear to us. And because of that, we remember the 23rd Psalm and we remember Jesus calling himself the Good Shepherd. But I will tell you, it's what, under, it's what underlies that that we really need. It is that place that we can go to get away from the noise and the prodding and to get away from all of the cowboy life that surrounds us. 
And boy, there's a lot of cowboys out there, aren't there? Do you hear what the Word of God is saying to you this morning? Can you sense that what Jesus and the psalmist together are offering you is a life? A life of relationship. Not of being prodded and poked and run in the wrong direction or stampeded when there comes a thunderstorm or run down into the cover of the river so quickly you only have time to lap up enough water to survive for the next few moments. No, but to go by the green water, the still waters and the green grass. And that image is so beautiful. And by the way, it does speak to something very deep within us that says, that's what I need. I think we've bought too much into the idea maybe in the church, that we can use the metaphor of the good shepherd but yet act like rough and ready cowboys in people's lives. When we know almost intuitively from the words of that metaphor, I'm the good shepherd and I lay down my life for the sheep, that there is something deep and personal and relational there that we need and that we want. And in fact, that is created, as someone said, in us. Not the desire to be stampeded or to be whipped into shape or to be run till our tongues are hanging out in life and then we're not even quite sure that we've reached our destination. No, indeed, to hear the words that say, I'll lead you beside still waters. I'll prepare a table before you even in the presence of your enemies and you'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yes, there are times when maybe the words to the old Willie Nelson song, Mama, don't let your grow up babies grow up to be cowboys, might apply to all of us who try to do ministry in the name of Jesus Christ, that we don't need to be prodding and pushing and nudging and throwing our whips out at people right now. What the world needs right now is that deeply rooted image, that deeply felt metaphor that is basic to life and basic to God's love for us when he says, I'm your good shepherd and I'll lay down my life for the sheep. Tired of the noise, tired of the dust of life, tired of the rush to get across the river safely, and come and follow, for you know that's what you are. The one who leads you beside still waters, who restores your soul, who is your good shepherd. Let us pray. Lord, we gather today because we are, while we are his sheep, our lives sometimes resemble that of cattle being run quickly on to our slaughter. Lord, it says in the scripture that you are the good shepherd and you lead us not to slaughter but beside still waters. That you're the good shepherd who doesn't allow us to die in the raging flood but leads us to a place of peace and tranquility that you're the good shepherd who literally spreads out and provides for our every need. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you give us this metaphor. But it is more than a metaphor. For it is at its truest who you really are to us. And Lord, it is at its deepest what we desire to be in relationship with you. Sheep to shepherd. Still waters. Quiet streams. Banquets. Eternal life. Lord, we 
thank you for our salvation and for all the gifts that the shepherd gives to the sheep. And we thank you that you lead us. May we follow. For we ask it in the name you taught us to follow him as he prayed, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen.